So again, welcome to the session about uh, prefabrication and passive house and retrofitting. Um, we are, this, this webinar kind of brings three main topics together. One, the challenge that we have with the climate and our construction sector, which as we've, many of us have already heard, um, contributes about 40% to all greenhouse gas emissions, at least in Europe. In other areas, it could even be more. Um, so it's clear that we need to do something about that. How do we tackle this? Well, we can go 100% renewable. Um, that's pretty well known, but we also need to look at the, the demand side. We need to look at energy savings. And that's where Passive House comes into play, which we'll learn about soon, or most of us already know. The next topic uh, that we're going to be dealing with is, of course, retrofitting. So most of the buildings that we need to tackle already exist, which um, brings into focus the importance of retrofitting. But of course, retrofitting can be kind of complex, it can be very time intensive, and it can also be costly. So there are solutions available to making retrofitting um, quicker, less cost intensive, but not always bringing it up to the standard that we would expect from passive house and the standard that we need to fight our, the climate crisis. So how do we bring them together? How do we make sure that our retrofits are cost effective and quick, but also to a high standard? Then the last topic that we're going to be looking at is the potential of municipalities. Municipalities and regions um, have a lot of, own a lot of the built environment. They have, have a lot of um, influence over, over it and they can set a great example by retrofitting their aging building stock. Um, so we're going to hear from the perspective of a municipality region on that topic. Great. Um, so the agenda is as follows. And we're going to go ahead and get started with Berthold Kaufmann from the Passive House Institute, who will tell us a bit about Passive House and Enerfit as the basis for energy con efficient construction. Good. Berthold, you can go ahead and have the floor and share your screen. Okay, yes. Good morning, everybody. Um, Zara, you should close your screen. No. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. Try once more. And I'll take num this one. Okay. So you should now see my first slide. Yep. Okay. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Bertolt Kaufmann from Passive House Institute, and uh, the colleagues of Climate Alliance and the uh, the workshop Sarah they they asked us to to make to bring everybody on the same page about what is uh, passive house building and passive house building design. So I will try to do this now the next fifteen minutes, and uh, well, um, just my agenda is what is passive house in a nutshell. So I will go through these four points. We need thermal insulation, we need uh, good thermal bridging and so on. Uh, but then uh, some words about economics and what Sarah already mentioned, the Enerfit, the retrofitting with passive house components. Well, and I, I always want uh, to emphasize quality control, quality control is uh, very much imp uh, very important. And I think Stefan Oehler will talk about this and, and Oliver Ottinger as well. Um, and this is the idea why we want to go to, to elemental um, construction. So there is the potential of going, going wrong is not so high. But anyway, quality is a big issue uh, on the construction side anyway. Okay, here you see the cross section a cross section of a typical passive house building, a larger one, a multifamily house or office building. Well, and just to go through, uh, we need a thick enough thermal insulation layer, here the orange. Uh, the building envelope should as well be airtight. 
well and the insulation layer should not be broken by thermal bridges so uh, if there are some uh, uh, thermal bridges sh you should optimize it uh, well air tightness i mentioned already windows should have everything of everything uh, so good insulation air tightness and a good optical throughput uh, well and then last but not least as we have done a good uh, envelope we we need air fresh air from outside uh, for breathing and living and therefore as you do not want to open windows uh, in winter because it's cold and in summer it because it's maybe very hot uh, we say well you should do it with a ventilation system with heat recovery uh, to save energy even more so the ventilation heat losses are very much reduced with a good heat recovery unit well and that's it so in the basics i could stop now and uh, to to tell you well you know everything about passive house well the next is you should go uh, if you go into some detail you should go for an energy balance calculation and for that we have established uh, a software tool package we call it phvp the passive house planning package with this uh, excel based uh, uh, spreadsheet calculation you can do an energy balance calculation for any climate zones you see here the cold zones the moderate and the the hot the warm zones um, passive house concept is ready for every everywhere well and with this climate with this um, energy balance calculation you can optimize your building envelope and your uh, service building services uh, so that it's ready for everywhere for your climate uh, location or your climate zone well and everything what we can do for new built uh, passive house buildings we can do for retrofitting old buildings so uh, the idea is just the same uh, take the components as windows and thermal insulation and, and so on take it and go for the renovation of your uh, older buildings and uh, with the energy balance calculation and with uh, what we do for certification we uh, we opened it a little bit so to be not so strict as for new builds um, here you see it on the right hand side if you go for energy demand method um, you may end with a little bit higher uh, heating and cooling energy demand for renovated buildings but well if you have to struggle with your parts of your building you can go for a building component uh, method so and check for any part of the building envelope to do it optimized uh, but uh, maybe a little bit relaxed so this is more or less what we do uh, in the framework of Enerfit uh, so retrofitting with uh, passive house components well the next question is always is it economically reasonable and to make it short yes we think it is uh, you will have a little bit more cost uh, a little bit more costly than if you go for local building codes so in germany this is the energy einsparverordnung but any any country you will have the uh, building codes uh, the experience is um, going for a local building code will be a little bit less expensive for investment this is the gray bars here uh, but the energy savings uh, with passive house and benefit will be better so you will have less cost for for energy during during operational phase and therefore it's about the same uh, going for local building code as for uh, passive house or benefit yeah here this is a school building in in germany and this is an office building here in Darmstadt and Germany, um, which were very successfully renovated uh, to uh, according to Enerfit standard. Well, and then some details you see here uh, a, 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 a cross section to a wall. On the right hand side, the old wall, the masonry wall, and on the outside, the, reno uh, the insulation layer for a renovated building. And you see here the window inside here. And here, uh, in practice, you see here the new window at the old wall and on the outside uh, polystyrene blocks. Yeah, so quite simple. And on that detail, it's about the same as for new build. Yeah. OK. Um, by the way, what we have learned from China, uh, you see here a so-called mock-up installation. This is to assure the um, quality for, this is to assure 
a training for workers who do all this stuff on the building side, on the construction side. Uh, they have set up this mock-up installation and everybody who will work there with this um, insulation or windows or air titers and so on, they are trained there uh, and can look every day what's going here and there. And this is, helps very much. And um, we, we always recommend to have this so that people uh, can get, go for the, uh, come on the same page very, very easily. As you may know, on many construction uh, sites, uh, the fluctuation of workers is quite high. Well, uh, just a word about ventilation system for renovation. You know, you need your air pipes uh, all through the building and sometimes you do not have so much room for that. Uh, here, just an idea how to solve this problem. You could go with the air ducts on the outside and cover it afterwards. You see here on the right hand side in the cross section, you can uh, cover these air ducts afterwards with the insulation layer. And so you have saved uh, two problems. You have your air ducts in, but you have not so much um, uh, problem with the air ducts inside your building and probably can do the renovation without uh, with people living there uh, as well. Okay, this about ventilation, very short. Well, and last not least, um, the Enofit idea, we ex uh, extended a little bit uh, about the question, um, what to do if you cannot do all your renovation once at once at a, at a time? So if you have uh, maybe uh, not so old windows and want to have to do the, uh, um, the new insulation, what to do if you have to go step by step? And uh, for that, we have uh, in an older project in the Eurofit, we have established uh, this Enofit Retrofit Plan, ERP. And if you want to look there, you can go into some detail. And there we give, uh, we give some suggestion how to check for the intermediate stage of a renovation. So if you start with a roof or with the start with the outside insulation and so on, what to do and what to care of. Yeah, here um, uh, collected the uh, criteria for passive house and benefit and on the left, the online handbook about all this. Please have a look there if you are interested. Well, so with that, I'm already finished for today. So I hope the nutshell was not too large and not too long right, right now. And I will give back to Sara to, to step on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Berthold. I think that was a record. Um, <laughs> I took a little too long, but that um, there's a lot to cover there and you did a great job doing it in a short amount of time. If there are any questions, of course, we will have a networking session afterward and Berthold will hopefully be there where he can yep. answer some questions. But um, basically, you showed us that Passive House is an amazing basis, a cost-effective basis for amazingly energy efficient uh, buildings. And you can also re retrofit using those same principles with Enerfit. Our yep. next speaker, uh, Stefan Oehler, um, actually puts this into practice in his, his daily work. He's from EcoWorks and um, he's done a number of um, projects, not only with Enerfit, but also with prefabrication. So um, here to tell you about that and also a little bit maybe about the outfit project because he's a project partner. Um, this project does try to combine both of those elements. Stefan Ulla, you can go ahead and share your screen directly. Hello everybody. Good morning. Thanks Sarah. I'm just trying to share the screen. Is it desktop number one? It depends. Um, you can share your whole desktop or just the presentation. That's probably easier. Let's try desktop number one. No, that's not. Whiteboard, calendar, safari. They gave me a lot of different options here. Should I? Um, oh, I don't have your, your presentation. Whiteboard. If, if you just click the one um, desk, your whole desktop, uh, then everybody will see everything on your desktop and just present from there. I'm just trying it like this here. As long as you don't have any secret Can things you see on your desktop. Anything right now coming up? 
Not, not yet. Oh, it's not so easy here in this program. Uh, did you already have your presentation opened? Yes, I the have. PowerPoint. You should you should be offered a PowerPoint um, uh, in in the Zoom uh, in the Freigabe menu. Yeah, if you go below Bild Bildschirm Freigeben, it's probably in German for you. And then on the right side, you'll see all of the windows that you have open. Just click yeah. the window with your presentation. With your presentation. Yes, I do the, I do the Bildschirm Freigeben, and then yeah. I have. A window with uh, nine different options. Right. Yeah, so just of, pick the one, one with this, your presentation. One should, should be PowerPoint to open this. Okay. So the problem will be, I'm very sorry that this is not so. Yeah. Um, digital meetings, we're all doing a lot of them lately, but of course there's different platforms. And if you're not uh, used to Zoom, uh, it could um, be a little confusing, but I'm sure we'll get this straightened out very soon. Um, oh, I'm missing at the uh, screen it, which opens there, after Bildschirm freigeben. At the right bottom, there was a, for me a, a, um, so to, to choose more uh, appliances. I had too much open. <laughs> Oh, aber, aber Stefan, das sollte eine PowerPoint sollte als Option da sein. Oder Bildschirm 1, 2, 3. Wie viele Bildschirme hast du? An ich habe das jetzt auf den gleichen Bildschirm gelegt, diese PowerPoint. Die liegt also hier auch drauf. Auf dem nee, wie viel hast du denn? Wie viele Bildschirme? Sieben. Ah, nein, an deinem, an deinem Rechner. Ein oder zwei Monitore? Einen. Das ist nur ein Monitor. Okay, dann gib doch den ganzen Monitor frei. Ja. Einfach Bildschirm 1, Punkt. Und dann sehen wir alles und dann kannst du das äh, PowerPoint groß schalten. So, taucht da was auf? Noch nicht? Nein. No. Oh, Leute, das ist ja schwierig. Nein, du musst noch Steph teilen. Du musst anklicken. Stefan, if you send us, send us your presentation and we can play it nee, for you. Klick mal, du musst Bildschirm 1 klicken und dann noch teilen. Unten rechts ist noch ein Knopf mit teilen. Also du musst noch frei in wirklich tun. Also Desktop 1. Bildschirm ja. freigeben. Ja. Und dann unten rechts Knopf teilen. Und Der dann blau. Kommt, dann Ganz rechts unten. Bei mir Systemeinstellungen. Nein, nein, nein. Also, I send you the, the uh, yeah. presentation. I think that's the easiest thing. Sorry Click for that. that. No worries. Okay. Um, while we're waiting for that, maybe, Stefan, could you tell us all a little bit about what it is your uh, company does EcoWorks and what your experiences are so far with yeah. retrofitting I'm to Enifit. That I drop my presentation. Yeah, don't worry. I'll, I'll set it up for you. Aligned. Okay. So now I sent the presentation. It's on the way to you right now. So EcoWorks, it's a, it's a new startup uh, located in Berlin. And we're taking all the things that Bertolt just told us about the Enerfit and about uh, all the details and the quality insurance. And we take all these uh, basics and all this information and try to develop a serial renovation system to go for retrofit on existing buildings. And what I want to show you this morning is our first project that we did in Germany, in Hamelin. And there we uh, made this serial renovation. That means we are working with prefabricated elements and we're trying to build up uh, uh, industrialized uh, construction, which is prefabricated in the factory. And then we take all the prefabricated elements to the site and we try to increase the, uh, the speed of mounting all these elements to the building to make it much faster and to make it much cheaper and to uh, achieve a net zero building in the renovation of, of existing buildings. So this is the theory and as soon as Sarah- yeah, I've got it. Are you ready? Yes, so if you can, all right, here we go. Wow, here we are, great. 
So I want to show you our, our first project, the zero ribbon innovation that we did in Hamelin. If you go on, please. We focus on, on the real problems that we think it's most important to, to focus. This is not any energy discussion or any kilowatt hours or electricity, but we want to, we are focusing on, on the CO2 emissions. So our balance is always focus, uh, focusing on, on the so-called net zero definition that we are using. That means very easy that all the credits we have from our photovoltaics in terms of CO2 has to be bigger than all the CO2 debits that will be produced by the building and the users inside the building. Next, please. One thing in, in practice that we found out is most important is the demand do not disturb the tenants which are living inside these existing buildings. And that makes it pretty difficult for us because our zero renovation system has to be modified in a way that we try not to enter the apartments of the tenants. That makes it much more complicated because then we cannot start uh, refurbishing inside these uh, apartments which are always completely filled with uh, all the things, all the furnitures of the tenants. And so we try to find a very effective system to do as much as possible from the outside. Next, please. Next focus is that we want to make it as affordable and as cheap as possible so that everybody can just afford these uh, zero renovation and the, the net zero building. We want to have carbon neutral living for all. And that means the system has to be very efficient and very low cost. Next, please. So we are producing a so-called renovation package. And this package will be prefabricated in the factory. And in the factory, we will have all the elements, all the parts which are necessary to be uh, mounted on site in a very, very short period of time. So we focusing on uh, mounting on sites in less than two weeks. So our goal will be a complete, a complete net zero renovation in, in maximum two weeks on site. That means the prefabrication and the preparation and the scan of the building and all these things have to be in advance and have to be very precise and very careful. And the renovation package consists of the window element, uh, the, the facade elements, the roof elements. The roof elements will be including photovoltaics. We will have so-called MEP elements. This will have the ventilation and the heat recovery uh, inside these elements, which also will be put in front of the facade. We will have basement elements, and this will be the most important uh, parts that will be prefabricated. Next, please. So the first uh, net zero renovation I already did in 2017 with, next please. This was in, in Ulm in Germany. It's a very typical building, also quite old building built in 1936. It's a very typical type of building which uh, is existing thousands of times in Germany. Next, please. And we did a zero, net zero renovation, or in this case, it was called energy plus renovation. So you can see already the photovoltaic on the roof and we have covered the whole building with insulation, with uh, new windows. It's all passive house standard. And in the monitoring, which took place two years, we could uh, confirm that it's a real uh, energy plus building in reality. Next, please. So our first EcoWorks project was uh, finished in 2000, this year, 2021. Next, please. It's three rows, three row houses in Hamelin. Next, please. They are oriented more or less east-west. Also a very old one built in 1930. 
Next, please. So it looks before the renovation. Next, please. And then we start bringing all these prefabricated uh, wall elements and roof elements to the site. You can see one of the first ones, including the windows, including ventilation, including uh, insulation, including cladding. So we just have to fix these prefabricated elements in front of the wall. Next, please. And even with the first project, we could achieve 20 minutes mounting time for each element. So here you can see in this uh, simulation how all these elements have been precisely defined in which sequence, which element has to be brought to the site and then just put onto the crane and from the, from the van to the crane and from the crane was just put in front of the facade. Next one. Here you can see how the element will be brought in. Next, please. It was brought between the, the scaffolding and the building and including all the things. So when the facade element was put in front of the existing wall, the complete finished element was already uh, showing the, the finished uh, situation of this part of the building. Next, please. In this case, all the facade elements were put onto steel brackets. So this uh, steel brackets were all fixed in inside the wall of the basement. So the, the first element was put onto the bracket and the next element was put on the first element. So the bracket was bearing all the load of, of the facade. Next one. It was similar with the roof elements. Also, these roof elements were prefabricated. It's, it's a, a sandwich panel with insulation and uh, a tin roof. And all these elements were just put on new purlins, which had the big advantage that in the moment you put one element next to the uh, neighbor element, there was always already the, the air tightness and the weather tightness fixed. That's it's a common industrialized uh, system which we use for this case. And that enables us to cover the roof very fast and to be weather tight very fast. Next one, please. Another picture from this situation. Next one. So here you can see the three buildings in a row and all these buildings were wrapped with these prefabricated elements so that the insulation was going around all the three buildings that makes it pretty compact and makes it pretty easy in terms of heat losses. Next one. We of course we follow exactly the, the definitions and the quality demands of, of the passive house standard. That means we have to look for air tightness with the blower door test. We have to look for a proper insulation going all around the building and we have to minimize thermal bridges. So in the end, we could uh, achieve the, the passive, passive house standards uh, for re renovations. And this is most important because then we have reduce the energy demand to, to a very low level. And we could afford with the energy production of the photovoltaic to become in this so-called net zero standard. Next one, please. So the whole old building was covered with a new skin, which was made of prefabricated elements. Next one. In this case, we have uh, very special uh, solutions for the ventilation system. So we decentralized the, the ventilation to avoid going into the apartments inside the building. So the wall elements have a uh, little uh, ventilation box with heat recovery, which was uh, put below the window and this whole uh, element was prefabricated, hung in front of the existing facade. Next one, please. 
this ventilation box, it's shown in, in yellow here, was exactly the same size as the window. So it was one unit and one element which was put into the prefabricated timber construction with insulation. And all this together was put in front of the existing wall, which is shown here on the upper part of this uh, drawing. Next one, please. In this case, we had a little uh, separate building next to these three uh, residential buildings where we put the heat pump and the water pump. Next one, please. And just to give you an impression of the uh, MEP, here you see the water tanks. And the next, please, you can see the uh, air heat pump, which is covering all the energy demand and all the hot water demand of of the whole three buildings. Next one, please. One special thing was that we uh, have to install bigger radiators as have been installed in the old buildings. You may be quite surprised why we have to use bigger radiators. Uh, radiators. This is because of the very low uh, running temperature of only 45 degrees because the heat pump is working much more efficiently if there's a very low heating temperature for this system. So it's the same heating temperature as if we would uh, use a floor heating. That's why we had to use bigger radiators mm -hmm. to make the whole system more efficient. Next one. And this is some more impressions from the almost finished building. The photovoltaic is not covering the whole roof. So we saved some photovoltaic because of, of economical reasons. Next one. On the other side, it's almost completely covered, except of this one tiny little roof in the, uh, this little window. This was necessary because of, of fire regulations in, on top of the staircase of this building. Next one. Another impression almost finished. And I think that's it now. Or is one more coming? Um, next, next, please. Yeah. Another one. Yeah. And that's the whole presentation. <laughs> I hope I'm still in time. Yeah, yeah, you are. No, no worries there. In fact, we've got five minutes or so if anybody has any pressing questions, because I know you have to leave, right? Yeah, I still have some, some time left. Okay, fabulous. Um, Good. Do we, Helena, do we have any questions? Um, um, yes, indeed. Uh, we have three questions as far as I can see. Um, the first one was from David Major. Um, he asked, uh, Stefan, who made the ventilation boxes that you were talking about? This is a, a German company who is offering this uh, ventilation system in different sizes, of course, and we just of how was it called the, the firma? I just can't remember the name. I'm very sorry, but it's a, it's a common. I have to look and will write down uh, when I find uh, uh, the name of the company. Great. Any others? Yes, there are more coming in. I don't know, Sarah, if you just want to. Yeah, there's a lot of um, really technical ones. If we have any any more general ones, maybe we could take those and save the technical ones for um, maybe an email afterward. Um, well, yeah, maybe here, maybe how do you ensure air tightness from the outside um, since you avoid interfering inside the homes? You're not disturbing the tenants. You're not doing anything really from the inside too much. So uh, how do you make sure that from the outside with prefab elements. Do you apply airtight ceiling? Um, yeah. And in, this, in this case, we defined the airtight uh, layer inside the new elements. So each element was prefabricated in airtight quality. And we had to sure, ensure on the sides that the connection between the element has to be airtight as well. So we made some uh, ceiling between the elements 
so that the new skin is at the same time a new air, airtight skin. We found out that it's maybe not the, the easiest way to do it like that. And we want to try in the next uh, projects to uh, define the airtight layer on the uh, existing wall so that we take it away from the prefabricated element and then we take it onto the existing wall to define it as the airtight layer that makes it easier on site. We have another question about the type of materials insulation used. Of course, with prefab, we're looking at a lot of wood, but um, what did you do for insulation and what are the options there? In this case, we used uh, mineral insulation for the facade elements. And in the future, we want to switch to uh, renewable insulations, which made out of uh, wooden components. Okay, great. Um, Perhaps another one, was the old roof covering removed to install the new purlins? And is there a ventilation layer between the old and the new facade too? We removed all the tiles and, and uh, the little uh, wooden constructions under the tiles and we put the new purlins. We found out that the, the problem of this old uh, roof construction is that it's an extreme uh, big tolerance needed between the old roof construction and this new industrialized elements. So we had to be very precisely uh, looking for the tolerance between this very uneven old roof and the very flat uh, new elements. That was quite a lot of work. Mm. And the second question is that we of course, had to be very careful not having any ventilation between the old wall and the new uh, elements. So we had to be very sure that there is no ventilation between these two layers. Mm. Yeah, um, very interesting. And of course, the questions just keep pouring in, but you've really demonstrated with this project, and hopefully it's it's uh, the beginning of many, many other projects, that um, really high quality retrofits to the Enerfit standard or Passive House standard even can be done in a very um, fast way that doesn't disturb tenants. Um, so it's it's really a great, great development to see. Uh, again, that's kind of what the, the outfit project is, is working towards. Our next speaker um, hasn't necessarily done any projects that combine all of those components, but is definitely on the track and will give us a municipal uh, perspective. Oliver Oettinger works um, for the region, the Landkreis of Darmstadt-Dieburg. Um, Darmstadt is, has been a Climate Alliance member since 1995. I know they're very active. And he's gonna tell us a little bit about the municipal reality. Um, maybe not the reality for all municipalities, but at least for some who are a little bit more forward thinking. Um, yeah, unfortunately, Stefan, Ula um, has to go, but there will be people standing by from the project afterwards to, to answer questions about the integration of prefab elements with Enerfit retrofits. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Stefan. Great. Okay, the floor is yours, Oliver. Yeah, thank you. I hope you can hear me. You can see my slide. Hello, everybody. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be able to tell you something about the activities of um, the municipality of Darmstadt-Dieburg. And um, what I want to tell you is, go to the next slide, outline, um, about something about who we are, what we are doing. And uh, I can tell you already that we are um, caring for the school buildings. So I will tell you something about school building speci specifics because uh, uh, what Bertolt said before was very general and uh, we have some things we have to look onto more uh, in detail. And then I will show you some um, examples, a retrofit example, new build examples with pre-created pre elements, wooden constructions, and yeah, somehow a, a wish list. Perhaps we can get have Christmas today or in the near future and outfit can, can help us with a 
the school building projects because when I heard this uh, two weeks uh, would be perfect in Germany we have six weeks of summer holidays so if the projects are over after six weeks I think this would be the biggest wish for all teachers pupils and and us that makes everything much easier we can speed it up so much okay so who are we we are a, um, a county uh, which uh, somehow uh, surrounds Darmstadt, Darmstadt next to Frankfurt in Germany. We have 290,000 inhabitants. And uh, in, in our region, there are 81 schools with nearly 500 buildings, uh, starting from the small toilet building up to the big uh, school building or, or gym. We started uh, yes, yeah, sustainability tracks, so let's say um, 2008 was a school building and retrofit program. And since then we have guidelines. So it's an internal guidelines for our planners, which says what we do, do want to have. And one point, which is very important is the PASIFA standard for uh, new build buildings and the NFIT standard for retrofits. Um, it's, it's an own, own operated um, company from this uh, county which is called the Dadi Werk I'm, I'm working for. And the, when we have to have to, to, to keep the, the schools, school buildings uh, running, we are about 80 office workers, a lot of engineers uh, and, and administrative pa uh, staff, about 80 caretakers. And uh, for the energy management, which is my area, we are four employees working together to, get, uh, to reach climate neutrality, so somehow. So let's come to the school building specifics because, um, yeah, so the, it's very different from, from uh, residential buildings in the point of heat loads, because if the pupils are there, we have about 20 to 30 pupils, which, may, which means that we have heat loads of uh, two to 2.5 kilowatts and this is quite a lot. This is the typical heating load of a room. So let's say the pupils can heat the, the schools um, when they are there. But of course, they don't want to, to get into a cold school building in the morning. So we need some heating still. Um, ventilation is very important, uh, just not only because of energy uh, measures, but also because of uh, so two concentrations at the moment, uh, Corona, I don't want to talk about it more in detail, but uh, CO2, uh, let's focus on that. So we have large air exchange rates. We have an intermittent operation about eight to 10 hours per day. We have um, long summer holidays and also the use uh, makes it uh, somewhat difficult somehow easier. So we have a use only from 8 to, to 17 uh, to 5 p.m. about um, holidays are already said and um, what we do have as a somehow problem or oh, what's happening there it was too fast. Um, the occupation phase is expanding because we have this uh, tendency to all day schools and this especially makes a problem in the in the summer which is not specific for passive houses but it is an issue I want to address here. Um, so two slides for the ventilation, why we do need it. Um, I show you here this CO2 concentration in a classroom. It's a red line starting in the morning with a low concentration of, of, of 1000 ppm. Um, and what you see here um, with, with very slightly ventilation by windows in the breaks, the green lines, um, you see that it's rising quite quickly uh, to 2000 up to nearly 3000 ppm and this is uh, calculated but what we do know from from uh, measurements is i saw already 3500 ppm so this is not good and what is the goal is to keep it below 2000 perhaps 2200 ppm this is quite easy if you have a ventilation system um it's shown here ventilation system is is on it's a small volume flow only for 20 pu uh, 30 pupils um so very minimal but um it brings the maximum of co2 concentration to slightly above this thousands ppms so what we what i want to show you here is we need this ventilation anyway um 
if we build a passive house or not. And if we don't have it, we have the situation that windows have to be opened constantly. And if I have a look into our schools, into our schools, they are standing things in front of the windows. So I'm sure they are not opened in, uh, in general. So mechanical ventilation works. Um, to the to this summer problem I want to address, um, before I come to it, it's a problem not of passive houses, but of all buildings, of new buildings, of old buildings, uh, but we have to address it with the climate change even more and for the future, I think, because if we want to build sustainable buildings, they have to ho hold in the future too, not only now. Um, and what I show you here is the heat flux very simple calculation, let's say at 11 uh, in the morning, um, you have internal heat gains by the pupils. It's the 2000, uh, slightly above 2000 watts, I told you already. And uh, ventilation brings also some heat inside because if it's uh, hotter outside, you get heat gains by the ventilation. And uh, the red part I want to focus on is, uh, shows that if you have exterior insulation, this uh, solar gains are, are handleable somehow. But if you don't have it, or if it's not operated well, then it is, um, sorry, it is becomes a problem because uh, you get uh, heat loads of uh, six kilowatts, which is really a lot and uh, buildings are overheating. And of course, this is not only part of the interior side of also, if you see here um, an older school building, uh, uh, infrared uh, photo, photo there, the maximum in the summer was not 30 degree, like it was the air temperature, but it was nearly 60 degree because of course the surrounding is heating up very much. And uh, here you see a very good example from uh, one, one very good example the uh, Hessenwald Schule we, we built some years ago. So we have bright surfaces, uh, which is important. You see the shadings, it's closed. Of course, it's also some point we, we already have to deal with because we have users inside the building and we can tell them what they should do. But of course, they, they should be somehow um, independent and they, they do what they, they do especially teachers are sometimes uh, very, ha have their own head, say it like this. Um, so ventilation is good and, um, sorry, shading is the most important thing. And what is very important for schools at least and for residential buildings too, is the night ventilation, night openings, what we have here um, in, the, in the atrium of the building, you see it's a, um, zoomed. It's a, a window which opens automatically in the night. And um, of course, what we do also need is a boundary protection, shading, weather protection. So the building can be used in the morning still like it was the day before. And it is uh, typically quite comfortable after cold, a uh, cool night. Um, user recommendations is a very important point and um, because as I told you, we can build there some techniques, but if it's too much techniques, the users say it's too much and they just do what they want or they switch it off or ask the care guests to, to switch it off. And uh, it's, it's you really have to explain things, but this is not, uh, and here, and uh, I want to stress again, it's not typical for passive houses, but it's something which you have to deal with, with all buildings if you want to have um, users which are certified. Let's come to economics very shortly. This is the Max Planck uh, Gymnasium. It was a new built building with classrooms only, sorry, I was too quick. And uh, it's a hybrid construction with rich wooden elements um, which were set into in the front of it. And there are some, some numbers. Um, just looking at the extra costs we had for passive house. We, we looked for the windows for um, uh, insulation materials and we ca I got a number of about 82,000 euros for this project with, for extra costs. So it's not too much for, it was two, two and a half thousand uh, square meters, I think. And um, energy savings, you see it here, it's 80, uh, 84,000 euros. So just in balance and then, we got some funding of the state of Hesse. 
for this project because it was a passive house project of 400,000 euros. So there are two ways of interpretation. One would be we earned uh, 400,000 euros by building a passive house. The other one, which sometimes is also important for politics, if, if they don't uh, think that the ventilation is necessary, we can say we, we just finance the ventilation by this funding. So choose what you want, but at the end, it's, it's a good thing and we, it's, it makes sense and it's economically, uh, economically reasonable for us as municipality to build passive houses, at least with this funding. Okay, let's come to some uh, examples. I will start with a retrofit example. So there it took a bit longer, um, not six weeks only, but uh, perhaps we can learn now. It was the Albrecht Dürer Schule. It was a full retrofit to the passive uh, and to the NFIT standard. The old parts of the building were set in, uh, were built in 1970, 1974, and with a to total area of 10,600 square meters. Uh, there was some, some extending, you see here the numbers, and the whole project costs were about 20 millions. So, and um, yeah, what at the end, we, we had a pellet district heating system for all of this, and as you see here, we had a well insulated building um, during three years nearly. Took a bit longer, as I already told you. Heating demand of 25 kilowatt hours per square meter and year. What is the NFIT uh, condition? And a quite good air tightness, I would say, for an, a retrofit of 0.6, nearly the new build standard. And um, Ventilation units, you see the number of uh, the volume flow is quite a lot, 35,000 cubic meters per hour. Um, triple glazed windows we installed. We had an exterior, exterior insulation of 0.11 uh, U-values and roof insulation with 0.13. LED lightning. And we have quite satisfied users after, afterwards. So it was a very good project. We are very proud of it that we finalized it like it was. Um, next project is the uh, Eichwaldschule in Schafheim. It was a modular building. Um, it was a, yeah, somehow we pimped a framework contract for um, for better containers, let's say. It. So we, we used, we, we made this contract for, for containers, for interim buildings mostly, when we needed quickly. And there we wanted to build a building which is uh, standing for the next 30, 45, 50 years. So we installed the ventilation we need, really. We had the triple uh, wind, glazed windows, um, installed a heat, heat pump. The other, the containers just were heated direct, electrically directly. And what you see here is, is uh, the view on the, um, on the staircase very bright, uh, the classroom still empty with the ventilation unit here on the uh, side of the room. Um, the outer view, it's a decentralized ventilation. So you have some uh, extract hoods here. And uh, this is a, a bigger part for the new pedagog pedagogical concepts. We call it the uh, mar marketplace in in our concepts. And here you see some pictures of the building phase. So there were also um, wooden elements coming on the construction, construction sites. The, the outer part was uh, nearly complete coming onto the construction site. But as you see as the left, wind, uh, left figure, um, the inner was totally empty and uh, there was uh, still a lot of work to, to be done. So at the end it took about, still six months after the, the outer building was, uh, after you could see the, the, the elements standing at the side um, until the first pupils could enter. Here was another project, but with a similar elements, also this modular building um, principles, uh, um, a mental cafeteria for pupils for up to 300 warm meals per day. At the left side, the, the 
area where the pupils could uh, should, should, should have lunch. Um, here you can see the ventilation ducts. It was a very interesting solution at the end because the ventilation unit is standing on the roof and we have these uh, timber beams which should not be penetrated by the ducts. And then we said, okay, we can enter uh, or uh, come through the roof at the one side with the extract and the other side with the uh, fresh air. And so it was a good solution for this here. At the right side, you can see the kitchen. At, uh, when I saw this, I was thought, okay, it's a wooden construction with a kitchen inside, but uh, couldn't this be a problem with the humidity? But at least up to now, and I'm quite sure that with this ventilation we do have, we won't have any problems. A new project uh, which should be built uh, the next, next year should start building phase. Uh, it's a two-story two school building, a large, a large building with 6,000 uh, square meters, should be built in the passive house standard um, with uh, wooden space cells and um, a central part which is massive. massive. And what you can see here is that this uh, structure of this um, modular element gives some some pressure to the freedom of architecture of course because you're not free in the in the dimensions anymore totally but i'm looking forward to this project very much let's come to the christmas wishes so here i brought one project it is the uh, sap uh, not the, the software company but the schule am pfaffenberg we have here in our region and it should be retrofitted, built in 1970s. Uh, it's a concrete sandwich construction. And um, the complete retrofit is necessary. You see here these um, facade elements, which are nearly, un uh, yeah, four centimeters, I would say it's uninsulated. Windows, which are blind, uh, not openable, and so on. So it, it needs a, con a reconstruction. And of course, if you have any ideas for this, would be interesting. Yeah, my wishes in a bit more concrete. Um, construction time into six weeks. Because if you have, if you look, go back to this school building, we have, we, we, we think we will have construction costs of 20 millions, and we will definitely have two to three, perhaps four millions for the interim building. So if we can get very quickly, this could be saved or this could be. Uh, cover the extra cost for the for the elemental things. Um, and of course, into these uh, elements like Stefan Oehler showed, um, should be also included the ventilation systems, uh, heating, cooling systems, perhaps. Electric installations, which is a big issue in, into our, inside of our school buildings would be interesting. And then pupils would be happy. And um, yeah, we of course too, thank you. Thank you so much, Oliver. It's um, clear that you're doing a, a lot of great things. I mean, your municipality, as do many school buildings, are are the one of the main focuses, and and you can um, get a lot of mileage out of out of building school buildings to the passive house standard or renovating them uh, to the NFIT standard. It seems like uh, you're doing both. And I, I really like that you put that wish list on there because um, you also see the potential of, of speeding things up and, and how that could even save more money, uh, which is a perfect um, segue to our next speaker, uh, Jan Steiger from Passive House Institute who is running the outfit project, which aims to bring this all together um, in residential, in the residential area, but also for municipalities and for municipal buildings. So um, unless we have any direct questions. Okay, I see, I see some specifics. Um, let's move on directly to Jan. And then we'll um, open it up to, to some questions and answers and move on to networking where you can definitely get directly in touch with the speakers. Jan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jan Steiger. I work for the Passive House Institute and I coordinate this Youth Nerd Project outfit. Um, can you ladies at the Climate Alliance share my presentation, please? 
because I just moved to another apartment and my internet connection is kind of unstable. So this may be a better solution. Okay, can yes, I? Yes, yes, one second. Yeah. I have it here. There yeah. we go. So, <laughs> just need to see which one I'm sharing. One second here. Um, that's not it. Go away. There we go. Do that again. Here we go. That should be it. Perfect. Thank you. Please do excuse any noise uh, interruption from the construction site nearby, but that's how it is. Okay, so I'm, I'm was asked to quickly uh, present you the EU funded project project outfit. Could you switch to the next slide? Um, we started last year already and we, yeah, we're doing this project to develop uh, deep renovation projects with a more reliable, faster and cheaper method. Um, so we wanted to look at one-stop shop renovation and energy strong concepts, but apply passive house principles to them. So really make sure that the, these renovation concepts are going to be in highest efficiency standards. Um, we want to promote these streamlined and serial renovation um, with energy efficient standards. Yes, go on. Um, point is to do that from the outside and our main objectives is to support and quality assure uh, and document real renovation projects, which is why we have a lot of case study projects. Uh, we also want to demonstrate this uh, by having monitoring results. Uh, this is a big part of the project. Uh, we want to develop quality assurance and approval and certification concepts in the course of deep renovation. And uh, we are working on some decision-making tools and guidelines, and we are trying to involve as many stakeholder groups as we want and uh, as we can. And of course, we need to raise awareness and increase the demand uh, for highly efficient renovation. This is what it's about at the moment in Europe. We have to renovate our building stock and that to a highly efficient standard. And yeah, of course, we want to vastly disseminate the project results uh, in conferences and other uh, events like this webinar. Please go on. So this is the consortium. As you can see, two partners from Germany, the Passifas Institute and Ecoworks. You have heard Stefan Oehler talking from Ecoworks. Uh, the Hellenic Passivhaus Institute from Greece, uh, the Stichting Passivbohn from the Netherlands, University of Innsbruck and uh, the Neue Heimat Tirol uh, from Austria, Wand Architectura from Spain, Pro Passive from France and Enerfect from Bulgaria. And I forgot to mention the Climate Alliance also from Germany, but I also always see them as a more international group, uh, being uh, the connection to the municipalities as our partner. Thank you, go on. Um, the project structure is, as you can see, it's very much built around these case study projects. Um, we will have some 15 projects where we want to test and apply the decision-making support tools or guidelines, which we are setting up the concepts uh, and systems for deep renovation, um, systems, for instance, wall systems or technical systems, which we want to develop further so they fulfill highest criteria. Um, we want to involve stakeholders by showing these uh, results from the case study projects. And we want to monitor the results from the case study projects in order to demonstrate that highly efficient renovation brings so many benefits like Mr. Otterdinger just told us. And of course the dissemination in conferences and so on is also part of that. These are our case study projects. That's just a collection. Um, you can see there's all sorts of challenges uh, within, like uh, on the top left, a building from Greece. You can see there's obviously a lot of balconies to be dealt with in Greece. Uh, from France, we have a lot of prefabricated ongoings already in the renovation business, but uh, there will also be um, historical facades where you may not be able to completely work with prefabricated systems. So we will also have a look at this. 
in the middle from Germany, uh, you can see the typical brick wall buildings, um, which need to be renovated. And uh, on the top right, there's buildings from Spain who then will have definitely more than two or three stories. So they go up to four or five stories. Uh, these will be or make issues if it comes to the net zero approach because you have uh, a lot more floor space uh, than PV on the roof. And from Austria, we have these typical buildings as you can see on the uh, right downside um, with a few balconies uh, in recesses and uh, yeah, in the mountain area where you have to apply a really high insulation levels. So this is a short overview of our uh, case study projects, which we are currently already working on or will be starting to working on in the near future. More information about these projects or ongoings and outfit you will see in our upcoming events. Uh, the next one will surely be, or the biggest one will surely be the International Passive House Conference in early September um, to be held at Wuppertal and online. As you can see here in, seven, in session seven, there will be, the topic will be prefabricated retrofitting. So uh, several presentations by um, companies or architects who already work with prefab renovation. And then a few presentations about projects in outfits or about the general uh, approach um, with uh, insulating from the outside and also uh, installing the mechanical systems from the outside. This is more or less it, I guess. If you have more questions, please do contact me. Here's my email address. And furthermore, I can say thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jan. Um, yeah, so as you saw, there you can definitely get uh, more information. At, there's a various number of ways to get more information. One of them is the Passive House uh, Conference that's coming up uh, for those Climate Alliance members um, and and municipal representatives. If you don't haven't had enough after our Climate Alliance International Conference from the eighth to the tenth of September, then you can jump on to the Passive House Institute Conference the day after on the 11th and hear more about outfit. Otherwise, um, you can always contact us directly if you wanna be kept involved. Um, with that, I'd like to share quickly um, where we stand right now. Yeah, we also um, have one more event coming up in our, uh, we've, Climate Alliance, we've made a, a summer a building series. Um, there's one more coming up next week, mobilizing homeowners for deep retrofits. This is really for the municipal uh, level though. So um, if you're a municipal representative and you haven't signed up, please consider it. Um, really exciting uh, development that's being made possible via the outfit project is the new climate alliance working group on buildings also for municipal representatives who are dealing with issues of retrofitting their schools etc um, there we will definitely be feed feeding uh, outfit results and results from other projects into the working group we're hoping to launch it this fall and if you want to let us know what your needs are so that we can better plan for them we encourage you to take part in our survey uh, municipal representatives who do uh, complete the survey will get a few goodies i like to call them like passive house uh, conference access and and uh, access to an e-learning course about Passive House Basics, all very helpful. Um, yeah, and as I said, if you're interested in learning more about Outfit and being kept up to date, please just contact us at Communications at Climate Alliance, which um, Here's the email address. Now, before we move on to the networking session that we promised at Wonder, I would um, say let's take the next 15 minutes or so and we'd be happy to take any questions from the audience if there are any. 
right now for for our speakers Oliver for Jan or maybe just generally about um, prefabrication in retrofitting we've got a few outfit partners here that could potentially answer questions uh, yeah Helena could you post the link to the survey in the in the chat fabulous Good. Um, I see there was a lot of exchange already in the chat about um, more concrete questions. So that's good that you're already in contact. Um, yeah, then I think if there are no urgent issues to be taken care of. Oh, we have one from Terry Hill. Any thought of using direct current in the retrofit? Um, not sure if Jan or Oliver could take that. I, I like the next question, general, that, that seems pretty specific with the direct current, but then again, I'm not, um, I'm not as deep into the topic as, as you two are, so. Any comment on the direct current? Uh, well. Prefabricated internal wall insulation? I'm supposing that's what was no, meant. No. Uh, direct, direct current means uh, the electricity supply, yeah, not with alternating current. Oh, like a battery, right? Of course. Like, uh, well, um, it, this is some uh, somehow tricky because um, all appliances, what you have in household or computers or anyway anything, these are all with uh, alternating current, and therefore uh, the most common. Uh, thing is to go for a, a grid feed and then take the electricity, electric energy back from from, from the grid, or do it uh, itself the the own usage of the PV energy, but not with a elect, uh, um, direct electric, not sorry, not with direct current, but with alternating current. So it's too special, mm -hmm. and therefore there are no, not so much, uh, not so many appliances available for that. I suppose that might also be a consideration when you're looking at um, energy storage uh, solutions. Well, the storage will go with direct current. Mm -hmm. A battery you can only right. charge with direct current, but there is always an alternating uh, device to to feed in to the grid back, and then you can use it on a conventional basis. I'd like to take, um, thank you so much, Berthold, for jumping in there. I forgot that you were around. Always a lovely treasure trove of, of information and expertise. Um, a general question about tips for prefab internal wall insulation. Top tips. <laughs> a tricky one. We haven't heard of that one, um, but we are definitely uh, kind of looking for it. Um, because this will also be a topic. So in case you check the outfit homepage every now and then, should we ever come across a system which is suitable? Um, maybe thermal bridge minimized, you cannot completely eliminate thermal bridges with internal insulation, but thermal bridge minimized and maybe with some uh, connection details which enable internal wall or, or ceiling connections, uh, then yeah, we'll, we'll have it hopefully posted there or any information about it. Yeah, we um, also have a question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. sorry. Um, I think this is a tricky from an architectural point of view and a geometrical point of view. Uh, the di diameters or the meshes of any inside wall partitions are so diverse. Uh, you, I think there is nobody willing to go for prefab elements. It's too special. And so, uh, well, it is a good idea. And Jan, I'm with you to have um, the easiest possible solution. Uh, but I think prefab elements for that, I'm not sure it, if this is really reasonable. We have a question about um, certified companies for free prefabricated systems. I, that's part of the outfit project coming up with um, a certification scheme for, if I'm not mistaken, for, for prefab. And I'm sure that will eventually, that information will trickle down to the Passive House Institute website in due course um, and be on 
outfit as well. Um, I don't know if you already have a list, Jan or Berthold. No, there, not yet. Well, there, um, you, there is no you certification, can, yeah. Well, you could go to our list of uh, construction um, prefab. Uh, now, what did you... Um, Jan help me. Yeah, construction, construction systems. systems. Yes. Yeah. And there are some construction sy systems already available. This is mainly for new build. Uh, but uh, we hope we can have those for uh, renovation as well, for retrofit. We have um, a few technical questions about the video. Yes, you will all get an email and link to the video. It might take a little while, but um, we've recorded this, so... You'll definitely get that um, afterwards. And uh, Jan underlined what I said about uh, if you if you take the survey um, for our working group on buildings, you will uh, get free entry to the online part of the Passive House Conference. But I just wanted to uh, also underline that that's for municipal representatives, not just for any interested architect who wants to go, um, unfortunately. Um, good, let's see. Uh, we have a question from Alan Clark about the window heat recovery and if it works for Anafit, if it's less than 75% efficient. Um, that would be for Oliver, I suppose. I think less, it's a certification issue or? Oh. It is. If I if I'm not mistaken, uh, the NFIT criteria asks for a heat recovery efficiency of minimum seventy five percent. Otherwise, the comfort of the of the inhabitants would be jeopardized. Um, I'm not sure if we allow exemptions, but it should be seventy five percent or more. Well, um, I would I uh, would like to emphasize this is well this is a uh, certification issue. But I, um, we are looking for the best working and the best um, um, cost-effective solutions. So, and um, the point is, so this window heat recovery or uh, some elements which can be combined with a window element to have a prefab element. This is the main goal. And what about the heat recovery? It should be as good as possible and it should be more than 75. Other, uh, otherwise it will be a problem, yes. Uh, but where, which way to go and what results will come, um, we have to, to evaluate what, what is the, uh, the best way to go. No? So everything is open. Thanks for answering that. My apologies. I mixed the name of the, <laughs> the, name of the component up with, with the project that Oliver um, had done. Um, we have an, a question here about dealing with the distribution losses from district heating and retrofit buildings, which of course is uh, even more important when you're looking at highly efficient um, buildings. Are there loss, are the losses prohibitive or can they actually be offset with other measures? Well, this is a very delicate uh, question. Uh, the point is in district heating system for existing buildings, uh, the district heating has to provide a very higher, much higher power than, than we need afterwards for the building. So, um, and, the, and the other point is the, the grid for district heating is most time very bad insulated. So the losses are really high. Well, on the other hand, uh, the investment in the district heating grid is very high and therefore it is hard to just um, give it away. Yeah, so it is all it will and it is always a very de delicate discussion how to go into future. District heating has in general some advantages and will be good for, uh, for a, a energy, a renewable energy future. Um, but um, you are right, we have to uh, get it in, a, in the whole picture and go for the, for the quality of the, of the distribution pipes. Well, and one solution could sometimes be, well, if the district heating grid is very old, uh, we just leave it as it is and uh, uh, stop it and go for heat pump systems in the new renovated 
uh, apartments and so on. But well, this discussion is uh, very hard and very tricky and very delicate. And so I think we cannot solve it today. <laughs> but we are on we are we are aware of this that it's uh, very complicated. Um, Berthold, am I am I correct in in saying that um, using district heating becomes more interesting when you're looking at complete districts on the district yes. level? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, a good point. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, district heating is always good for if you go for a downtown. Uh, um, a compact building. So uh, connecting multifamily buildings to a district heating uh, is always good uh, or ma mainly uh, good, but uh, well, the parameters have to be checked in detail. Yeah. Mm. Thanks for that. Uh, by the way, a uh, short remark, we have, we do check this in PHP. So if you go with district uh, heating, you can evaluate the parameters of the P, uh, of the district heating and go into PGP and look what is the overall impact of this and that solution. Mm. So, well. I like this question though, because I know um, a lot of municipalities are looking at their district heating um, as one of the main solutions to um, building challenges to, to energy. Um, and maybe not focusing as much on the retrofitting of the buildings, which is seen as more complex. Um, so it's it's interesting to kind of weigh what what is is more important. Do I want to put my emphasis on looking looking into the district heating system, or do I want to try and get the buildings to be as high quality and use as less as little energy as possible first? Well, well, um, we have to go for both. Yeah. And the question is, what go, what doing first? And the the priority from our point of view is quite clear. We should first go for the building, and go that the the buildings are the best performance uh, po possible. So the demand and the consumption of energy in buildings is as low as possible. Well, and then we should look for the um, energy supply, and the one uh, pathway could be. Uh, start renovating the building and then afterwards look uh, how to optimize the, um, the district heating or, or what else. Um, but you should have uh, an answer and uh, um, an idea for both from the beginning. So, uh, and this is what you say, the district, the whole system of the district uh, is the, the point. Uh, but um, it is misleading to go uh, for the district and only say, well, let's go for the district heating and everything will be repaired. Yeah, this is misleading. So mm -hmm. um, the best performance for the district heating, uh, the best primary energy factor cannot help if the buildings are uh, wasting energy. Well, Right. Yeah, same goes for renewables, I suppose. Um, you need yes. to look at it as a whole picture in combination, yeah. which is what yeah. Passive House also does. Um, Oliver wanted to Sarah, say. Sarah, yeah. may, may I perhaps add? I, Please. I think one point for this district heating is the temperature level, because if you have the old buildings and you definitely have a high temperature level, and then the question arises, which we have at, at all our uh, schools where we have a central heating with some distribution, which temperature level do we need? Do we stay at the 70 degrees? Or do we say, okay, we, we can keep with uh, 45 degrees and then hot hot water is not the point for us uh, too much because uh, this can be easily done um, with direct heaters. And so we don't have the problem with overheating by this, this distribution losses, which was the uh, next question. Um, this, this makes sense and schooled is quite a lot, I think. And uh, yeah, especially this temperature levels coming back to battles, things is, uh, is, is a question, all, uh, especially if you think of the, the next decades. Yeah, because mm -hmm. you stay at some stage and then you have a transition. In 40 years, you can say, okay, you, you lower the temperature level, but you can't do it before the last building is renovated or has a new heating. So perhaps there's you, a definite order can, that makes sense. Yes, yes. And uh, perhaps you can. what you can do in the intermediate stage is to use the, the code part of the district heating. Hmm. So you, you have a better usage of the seat. 
Oliver, we're definitely going to be inviting you as a guest speaker to the <laughs> um, to the uh, working group on buildings. Um, I think it's time to close this. There's one last question that's just a very basic question that a lot of people struggle with. Um, it was touched upon here, um, but let's let's go into it quickly again. What to do about the summer situation, overheating in a passive house, climate change is creating increasingly hot summers. I know Oliver, in some of your uh, projects, you showed how you can um, ensure a night ventilation, cross ventilation, and protection against burg burg burglary, I can't speak my own language, uh, weather, et cetera. But uh, what do we do? How, what's the solution there? It's hard to say what is the solution because at the moment, uh, what I showed you, these kind of more massive buildings using night ventilation, using shading, um, having uh, users which, which are yeah cooperating, it, it works quite well, I would say. But for the future, if you think of the temperatures which were the last weeks in Canada, mm -hmm. this will not work. And uh, this is new build building um, I showed to you. There we had a lot of discussions about cooling, active cooling, because our boss, boss says, no, we don't want to have active cooling. If we have built it once, everyone wants to have it. I, I totally see this point. Um, but at the end, we said, OK, if you take a, a future climate data set for this building and you calculate the, the over temperatures, it definitely says that you need a small a fraction of cooling. And um, so I do see the, the direction that we the need slight direct cooling combined with very good measures so that the time we use it is very small and perhaps we can use it, uh, switch it on in, in 10 years only, not directly, but um, ways goes there. I so for now, and for temperate climates, especially, and just always, we have our external shading, which is important. Stop the heat before it gets into the building. We have um, our net night ventilation, um, where we open the windows at night, if at all possible, to um, cool the building down, assuming the nights are cool. When that doesn't happen in the future, as you were saying, we might need active cooling, but again, building and retrofitting to a high efficiency standard makes it so that you will need less cooling anyway than you do with a conventional building. So it's a win-win, even if we do have to end up using some active cooling. I, yes. I could also add that within the outfit project, we are working on guidelines, um, uh, how to check for you know, future temperature increases in the summer or uh, stress stress test your building if, for instance, night ventilation would fail or shading would fail, the, the shading concept would fail, could the building then still uh, be in, a, in overheating areas which are acceptable or get unbearable? And um, this is going to be a, one of the first results of, of outfits and will be surely presented at the next conference. Exciting stuff. Yes. Um, I have here a heat pump. Can it be used in reverse for cooling? Yes. Generally, yes. Um, and uh, then a few other comments about, yeah, where we live, uh, hot, humid climate, night natural ventilation doesn't work. Exactly. So that's kind of what we were discussed, discussing before. Also, two street noise problems. I live in the middle of Frankfurt. I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, I'm going to close this now, and let's, let's continue the discussion. Um, on wonder. Uh, let me share my screen quickly. So if you've not used wonder before, okay, if you're using um, an iPad, sometimes in, in the past we've had problems. Uh, so my apologies in advance if it doesn't work out, but go to this link. Um, Helena will put it in the chat for you right now. You'll be asked to enter your name to take a photo and then you can start networking. I would ask um, all people who were speakers or who are outfit project partners to go to the corners so that um, people know where you are and can mingle. If you have technical difficulties, you will see that there's a help desk at the very top. Um, I will be there along with my colleague, Helena, and we can help you. Okay, thank you very much for participating and uh, you'll be hearing from us soon with the video and presentations. Thank you.
Thank you.